Hello everyone, welcome to Rob's Gaming Table. Today on the table I got something a little different for you. This time it's a draft overview for Game of Thrones the Card Game 2nd Edition from Gen Con 2016. A little bit before Gen Con, uh, Fantasy Flight Games, the company that makes Game of Thrones a card game, tweeted out that they were going to add another event to their event schedule. This time it was Game of Thrones a card game draft. Uh, it was then cleared up that it was actually second edition, which we didn't expect to see until Worlds, which is later in November of 2016. So we actually were going to get a sneak peek. They did a limited run of uh, 32 tickets. I was able to get in with my wife and a few friends, uh, so we were able to draft on the Saturday night of Gen Con. Um, so in this video, I'm going to go over uh, what draft is in Game of Thrones, the card game, uh, second edition, and what you can expect. And uh, you should be able to see on the screen here who I'm drafting with. Uh, I got my wife here. You see Throne Runner in the back. I got Kevin Austin. I also have James Booker, Kevin She, uh, Brian. I'm sorry I didn't remember his last name, uh, but I played with him before in past tournaments. He's always at Gen Con. Nice, nice fella. And uh, yeah, you can see us there. Uh, also, Philippe from Montreal. And uh, the eight of us got together to, dra to draft. Uh, Fancy Flight was nice enough to let us draft together. So I'm going to go over uh, draft a little bit. So they have a starter pack and a draft pack. The starter packs are usable. We'll go over a little more detail on what that is, and I'll review the cards in that shortly. And we'll also discuss a little bit about what you can find in the draft packs. Uh, but the draft packs you buy separately each time you need a draft. They come with 50 cards in them each, and you draft them around the table in sets of 10. And we'll go over that here in the rules. Uh, you should be able to see on the screen right now uh, the draft format rules, uh, which come in the starter pack on little cards. Uh, so let's read them out here. So the draft format. Uh, draft is an exciting limited format for a Game of Thrones the card game. In a draft, each player creates a pool of eligible cards for his or her deck by selecting individual cards from randomized draft packs. After this process is complete, each player builds a deck from his or her pool of drafted cards, and the players use those decks to compete in a tournament. So how the tournament was at Gen Con, we did three rounds of Swiss. Uh, everyone who participated got one of the full art uh, Jon Snow cards, um, and then the top four also got a second copy of the Jon Snow card, and the winner got the Spot Gloss Night's Watch house card, the plastic house card that they were given away at Gen Con for the Joust tournament, and I believe in draft they were giving those out too. So let's continue with the rules here. To draft, each player needs one, a Game of Thrones, the card game draft pack, and one starter, uh, basically like I described earlier. Players must also provide their own power counters and gold tokens. So bring your sleeves, bring your tokens when you go to play draft, and your play mats if you want to use them. Um, so you can sleeve up your cards and whatnot. All right, so let's get into the setup. So setup, players are arranged in drafting pods of five to eight players. Each player opens his or her draft pack at the table and in sight of the other players but does not look at or reorder the cards. The contents of the draft starter are set aside at this time. So you just put your draft starter aside. We look through them first to kind of get an idea of what's in there. We'll go over that, like I said, later. Um, and then you start drafting and uh, we'll get into those rules. So here's how to draft. So to draft these steps, uh, follow these steps in order. So step number one, each player draws the top 10 cards of his or her draft pack. Then each player uh, looks at his or her 10 cards, selects one of those cards to draft, and places it face down in his or her area as a drafted card. Step three, each player passes the nine remaining cards, those that were not drafted, face down to the player to his or her left. Players may not pick up or look at the cards just passed until all players at the table have completed this step. Step number four, each player looks at the nine cards that were just passed and selects one of those cards to draft. The drafted card is placed down in his or her stack of drafted cards. Step five, each player passes the eight remaining cards, those that were not drafted to the player on his or her left. And we got step six. The process of drafting one card and passing the remaining cards to the left is repeated until no cards remain to be passed. When this occurs, the first round of the draft is over. Step seven, between rounds, each player may review the cards he or she has drafted. Step eight, for the next round of drafting, each player draws 10 cards from his or her draft deck, drafts one, then passes the remaining to the right. All remaining cards for this round are passed in the opposite direction that they were passed in the previous rounds. So you just keep alternating back and forth, it seems. And then uh, number nine, the draft process continues five through five, 10 card rounds until all the cards have been drafted. During each round, undrafted cards are passed in the direction opposite in that in which they were passed during the previous round. So the passing occurs in a left, right, left, right, left manner through each of the five rounds of draft. 
And then uh, in the draft pack, uh, so once you're done uh, getting all your 50 cards, uh, this was actually at the end of the draft pack, which is kind of cool. So once you know, you've know you grabbed your last pile of 10 cards from your draft pack and you've drafted them all, this is sitting in front of you on the table. And this uh, goes over de deck building and play. So each player's deck must be constructed only from the cards he or she has drafted and those in the draft starter. Each draw deck must have a minimum of 40 cards. Each plot deck must have exactly five cards. Each player must use a single faction card. Each player may run one of the four agendas from his or her draft starter, and we'll go over those agendas shortly here. Uh, loyalty restrictions are ignored when building a draft deck. So this is important. I've seen this question a lot in the Facebook group and online. Um, people are asking about loyalty. So it's completely ignored when building a draft deck, which is kind of cool. Uh, and there are quite a few loyal cards in this draft pool. And there is no upper limit on the number of copies of any given card that can be used in a deck. So if you've drafted like six copies of a unique or a neutral or whatever card, you can put them all in the deck. It does not matter. A player is bound only by the number of copies of that card he or she has drafted. A player may revise his or her deck in accordance with these rules between games. So it's kind of cool. So you'll have a little side draft pool. If you build a 40 card deck, you'll have 10 cards left from the ones you drafted, plus some from the starters you may not have used. And you can swap those in and change them out as you feel necessary. You can even switch up your agenda if you feel like it, uh, which was kind of neat. Uh, so you can kind of see how your deck performs the first round and then tweak it based on that. And then while playing, all standard rules, uh, play rules for Game of Thrones a card game are observed with the following exception. If a player runs out of cards in his or her draw deck, that player does not lose the game and may continue playing using cards in his or her hand and in play. So you basically can't deck yourself in this. You don't lose. They only give you a 40 card deck. You can draw it out. If you draw it out, just keep playing with what you have and try to do the best you can. But you do not lose. The game does not stop. It only stops when you get to the 15 power. All right, so now we're going to go over the four agendas that were mentioned. Uh, so the first one you can see here is the power of wealth. Uh, when you announce the power of wealth as your agenda, name one faction. You may include cards from that faction in your draw deck and plot deck. Reduce the, no, reduce the cost of the first in-faction card you marshal or play each round by one. Draft format only. Uh, draft format only is something you'll see on a few cards in the draft pool on characters, locations, events, attachments, and these agendas, even some plots uh, that let you know they're only they only work in draft. You can't take them and play them in in the regular joust or melee formats of this game. They got to stay in draft. They may come out with versions later that may be a bit different, but these ca cards and these copies of these cards you cannot play in the other formats. Uh, that's what the draft format only is there for. So this, this agenda acts kind of like a little fealty. It's cool. It lets you, it lets you banner in another faction. Uh, and then this acts as fealty before any card that's from your in faction. So not loyal. It doesn't care about loyal. It's just like a minus one on any card from your main faction. So that's kind of neat. So if you've drafted mainly from two factions, this can help you out. The next agenda is uh, Protectors of the Realm. And it's got a kind of knight and army theme going here. You may include knight and army characters from any faction in your deck. And then it's got an action. You kneel your faction card to choose a knight or army character until the end of the phase that character gains renown. Also draft format only. Uh, so this kind of helps a little rush theme here. There's lots of knights, lots of armies from all different factions. There's neutral ones in the pool. This helps you if you're drafting those, you can go that, that way. Because you've seen these in your starter, this agenda. So you can kind of draft based on this if you're trying to build this deck. Uh, so I look forward to these these options of, of these agendas for that purpose. Uh, every time I draft, I might want to try to draft uh, for a different agenda. But it also helps the other way around. If you just, based on what you draft, you can look at your agendas after what you draft and decide based on that. So we'll get on to the next one here. It's Treaty. Uh, when you announce Treaty as your agenda, name two factions. You may include cards from those factions in your draw and plot deck. Action. Kneel your faction card to draw one card, then choose and discard one card from your hand. So a little bit of draw helps you get through your deck a little quicker, get rid of cards you don't need, um, and dig. Uh, so that one's kind of neat. Pretty basic. Throw in two factions together. So if you're drafting two main factions, this helps you out. And then we have the last agenda here, Uniting the Seven Kingdoms. And this one, you may include cards from any faction in your draw deck. So this helps you out if you've been screwed on, on draft, you've drafted a little bit of every house, some neutral cards, whatever, and you just can't seem to get a main faction out of it, don't worry about it. You just throw this together, and then it increases the cost of out-of-faction cards you marshal or play by one. So it gives you a little bit of punishment for including cards across the board, but you may be able to abuse this and take advantage of it. So it's kind of cool for that. And that... Uh, that's basically what uh, the agendas are, and we're going to go into what the starter pack is. All right, everyone, here we have the draft starter for the Game of Thrones of Card Game second edition Valerian draft set. Um, in this pack, uh, everyone gets one of these. Um, they, in first edition, they retailed for about five bucks. 
Um, and it gave you enough cards to get started uh, before you draft from a draft pack, which is separate, and that's around 15 US, uh, I believe, is the retail on that. It could be a little higher now. Uh, it's been a year or so since we drafted first edition. Um, so prices may have gone up. But anyways, in this pack, um, it's going to give you the house card, the plots, the possible agendas you need to get going and uh, build your deck. So let's go through this starter pack here. So we got the little front card here. And how they've done it is uh, they've printed the instructions uh, that we've already gone through. You've seen these already. Uh, but they printed the draft format, uh, what happens there, how to draft, and the rules and whatnot for that um, that you can see here. Um, and what else they've done is, I guess, to save on printing costs. And since you're only going to play one main faction, um, they've given you uh, dual-sided house cards here. So there's no banner agendas in this. Um, you can play other factions, but you're going to play them um, by using these agendas here. Um, so we've gone over these agendas already, so you've seen what they can do. Um, but they are included in here, double-sided, uh, as you can see here. And they also, to help you uh, not have an econ problem, uh, you're also given three Rose Roads and three King's Roads uh, in the pack uh, to help you get going. And another thing they've done for you is uh, they've added these draft pack only guys, two of them. Uh, the House Bannermen, which are one gold, power icon, one strength. They're allies, non-unique. Uh, they have the marshalling action, Neil House Bannermen, to reduce the cost of the next in-faction character you marshal this phase by one. They are a draft format only card, as you can see there. Um, but you get two of them in the start. Like I said, you also get a Waddling Scout, which we can know that card from the, the regular card pool and a Ral Shirts Raiders. You get one of each of those uh, just to help you with some neutral cards if you're having trouble jamming a couple factions together. Uh, so let's go over the plots. You guys know Filthy Accusations already uh, from the card pool. Feast for Crows, that's a familiar one. You guys already know that. Feast or Famine, this is a first edition card uh, if I recall correctly. It's 252 or the stats across the top. It's got a reserve of 5. It's a summer and a winter. So it has an option here. It's got a win revealed. Uh, you may increase the gold value on Feast or Famine by 5. So you can make it a 7 gold plot. If you do, reduce the claim value on this plot by 2. Draft format only. So you either choose this as like a closer, um, where you get to claim, or you can use it as like something to boost your economy to get you going. Um, but it's your choice. So you either take high gold or low claim. And uh, it's great because you have only five cards in your plot deck for this format, so you're gonna see this more than once. Most likely you'll cycle around a lot faster than regular joust or melee. Um, so you might get to use this plot as kind of like two different plots as you go through the draft. So that one's always a good one in draft. And uh, you got Summon by the Conclave, which was a plot in first edition also. Um, it's 4 one, one uh, and it is a kingdom, and it's got a seven reserve. It's got a when revealed, search the top 10 cards of your deck for an in-faction card, reveal it, Add it to your hand. Shuffle your deck. So in first edition, it was like search for a character in your deck. This is lets you get a card. It just has to be in faction, but any card, attachment, location, character, event, um, and add it to your hand. Then you shuffle your decks. And as you can see down here, it is draft format only. And the uh, last plot they give you in the starter deck, um, and keep in mind, you can draft plots in the draft pack. Um, so these aren't your only plots to choose from, but I mean, sometimes they might be if you didn't draft any plots. That's your choice. Usually you get a choice on that, um, but people might be taking them and you might not really see more than one or two in a whole draft. Um, but this is the final plot. The Pale Mare, 481. It is, as you can see, draft format only. It's an omen, six reserve. It has a win revealed. Each player chooses any number of characters he or she controls with total printed cost 10 or lower. Kill each character not chosen. Cannot be saved. So you can either pick some big characters, a big character, little character, a bunch of little characters, but you got to kill all the ones not chosen and uh, they can't be saved. So it's kind of like a cool little reset, kind of like a wildfire assault a little bit, um, but a little bit different. Uh, but I really like it. It's really cool. I didn't end up playing with it in the draft, but I, I noticed it was almost in everybody else's plot deck. Um, so it was a really neat one to have. Uh, I didn't play it because I drafted another card uh, that was a reset and used that instead. And uh, here at the end, uh, we got the draft starter contents. So it shows you actually what you get in the draft pack. So you know how to put it back together. So you don't have to rebuy the starter. You can use it again at future draft events. And all you have to buy is a draft pack of 50 cards to do the draft. And that's, that's it for the draft starter.
All right, now let's review a few of the interesting cards that we saw um, in our draft of eight players. This is the cards that I pulled out of the ones that I drafted, the ones my wife drafted. Um, but we saw some other neat ones. I'm sure you guys can see on the Facebook group. A lot of people are posting them um, while we were playing at Gen Con. And it's funny, a lot of the pictures came from people who were in my pot of eight people that we, uh, we uh, brought together. And we were just all excited showing off plots and, and, and cards we hadn't seen before. So it was kind of cool. Um, so here's the ones that I drafted and my wife drafted, like I said, uh, from the Valerian set. So that's a little cover you get from the draft pack, which we already saw. All right, so we got uh, Support of Salt Cliff. It's a two-cost attachment, Greyjoy, character only, it's condition. Reaction after you win on unopposed challenge in which attached character is attacking, stand attached character. This is draft format only. So sorry, I should have said that. The next few cards are just going to be draft format only, so it's kind of neat to see these cards. I don't know if they'll ever release them in second edition, but right now they are draft format only. So that's a cool attachment. Uh, here we got another draft format only card, the Night Fort for Night's Watch. Unique, it's the North, costs a buck. Challenge action, kneel the Night Fort to choose a defending Night's Watch character. Until the end of the challenge, that character gets plus one strength for each attacking character. So it's kind of cool. It's like um, a little bit like the melee keyword in first edition, if you guys are familiar with that. So a nice defensive location for Night's Watch. Uh, I got the Raven Tree Elite, another draft only card. This is uh, six cost, five strength, military power. Um, they are an army, host Tully, uh, no attachments in stealth. Each host Tully character you control gains immune to opponent's triggered effects while it is participating in a challenge draft format only. Now I know uh, Big Fat Cat is uh, in the draft set, so she's another host Tully card that I saw that day. So this would work with her. Uh, this one's kind of neat. I drafted this one right away and kind of threw him in the deck as one of my bombs. Um, and I grabbed him because he's neutral, he's big, and uh, he works with other characters here. Uh, so he's six cost, intrigue, uh, military, three strength, unique. It's Lynn Cornbray, or Corbray, sorry. Lynn Corbray, House Iron, and Knight Traded. Uh, he's got the stealth keyword, and his text reads, Each non-army character you control with printed cost six or higher gets plus two strength. And he's draft where I'm at only, like I said. So this guy worked great. Um, I had some large characters, and, and that's kind of what you want to draft. You always have to draft a few, um, but they're most likely big big guys, are, and the unique ones especially aren't usually armies. So this kind of gives him a plus two bump, which is pretty sweet, including himself. So he's a, a six cost, non-armies. He's three strength plus two, so he's a six for five, which isn't bad, as long as he doesn't get blank. But he's got stealth, which is super juicy. So I really like this guy. I like the icons, so that's why I grabbed him right away. This is an interesting one. So we've been complaining about some economy. Uh, this one's kind of weird, though. Uh, I thought it was draft format only originally, but now looking at it now, uh, it is from the Lions box. And the cool part is you can see this on the bottom of the cards. Uh, you can actually see uh, if they're common, uncommon, or rare. There's a little letter there beside the number for the draft set. And if they're draft, they got this little yellow icon. I probably should have pointed this out earlier, but I can see the lion head symbol there. So I know this card is from the Lions of the Rock box coming out, um, which is kind of cool to see this stuff uh, ahead of time. So this is Ocean Road. It's a zero cost location, neutral. Westeros trade is it's limited. Uh, marshaling action, kneel the Ocean Road to reduce the cost of the next neutral or out of faction card you marshal this phase by one. So this is super interesting. It's common. I saw other people drafted this card and got it in their deck. I grabbed it too. Figures the neutral card's economy is good to have. Especially since you're doing 40 card decks, uh, you want to see economy to play these big characters. So you can be kind of funny when you have a 40 card deck, it's a lot more consistent. So you can put a lot of big characters in, flood it with economy, and you usually don't get screwed up on uh, getting getting hit with a lot of that during draw. But uh, I, I like this one, it's kind of neat. So this is coming, we're getting another neutral economy location. Uh, so that can help, I guess, a deck type that's including neutrals and uh, out of faction cards more often. Kind of like the reverse banner idea, I guess, too. And this one uh, is a also from the Lions of the Rock box, according to the little symbol in the bottom right. Uh, it's a common. It's uh, two cost, military intrigue, one strength, wildling bandit. So it's non-unique, wildling traded. While wildling bandit is attacking an opponent with more gold in his or her gold pool than you, it gets plus two strength. So it can be a three strengther if you're hurting for gold. So this kind of be neat with uh, Mance Raider, I think. I think this would be a good card to have, especially after you spend the money on ambushing uh, wildlings. You might not have as much money as your opponent, so it's kind of cool. I'm sure you guys know some other uses for this guy and can think of how he's awesome, but I, I like him a little too cost chud, and uh, he can definitely get buffed from the wildling horde, that's for sure. Um, so the next one we have is neutral. Uh, it's the Silent Sisters. They're back from first edition. They're three cost, intrigue, and power. 
Uh, one strength, their ally traded, which is a little dangerous. I did see a little bit of ally hate in the draft pool. Um, hit me that day. Uh, but my wife drafted this card, loved it. She loved it from first edition. But uh, it's the Silent Sisters. They get plus one for each character in your dead pile. So that works great with a certain card coming out. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's a plot 200 uh, Valar Morgulis. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. But anyways, it's coming. It kills all characters or something like that. Um, but it definitely, this card is good for playing after Valor, getting it out there because she's a bomb, or they're a bomb, I guess. Um, they get huge, and they got a good icons there, nice intrigue, can help fill out a house that's short on intrigue. All right, we got uh, Knight of the Summer, four cost Tyrell card. He's a military power, three strength, non unique. He's a knight. While there are more summer plot cards than winter plot cards revealed, Knights of the Summer get plus two strength and give renown. So that guy's cool. I think he's been spoiled already. You guys have seen him. But he's from an upcoming chapter pack, according to the little symbol there. Um, we also have Brienne of Tarth. Unique. Tyrell. Five cost. Military power. Five strength. She's a lady. Renown. While you control a king character or Catelyn Stark, Brienne of Tarth does not kneel when declared as a defender. So that's kind of nedly. You put her with somebody she's loyal to, and she'll protect them to the end kind of thing. So that's kind of neat. Good little five cost character. Uh, this one I played with all day, loved him. Uh, he's unique. I drafted three of him. It was great to put him out there, dupe him uh, before Valor. So he was staying on the board because I could save him with the dupe, obviously. So he's two costs, two strength, power icon only. It's Edric Storm. He's unique. He's a bastard. He has a reaction. After Dominus phase begins, choose a character. That character does not contribute its strength to its controller's total for the Dominus phase. So great way to help the Brathian Dominance theme. Good card there. Now this guy it helps him too. Uh, this guy's the bomb I built my deck around in draft. Uh, I loved him. Uh, he's seven cost, military power, six strength. He's unique. It's Stannis Baratheon. He's loyal. He's a king and a lord. During power challenge, pa bleh, during power challenges, each participating non-king character gets minus one strength. So that's on your side too. So anyone in the power challenges, while he's out, whether he's kneeling or standing or whatever, there's just a passive ability, a lasting effect. They all get minus one strength. So you can't use your little chuds in the challenge, your little your little um, cost reducer characters that are one strength. There's gonna be minus one. Unless you have a way of making them a king. Uh, he's got a reaction. After you win dominance, choose a non-loyal character. That character cannot stand during the standing phase this round. So it's kind of cool like the other stand. It's a little bit of lockdown there, but you can target it this time and, and pick whichever character you want to keep down. So it's kind of cool. I like that. And we got a Lannister location here. Lannisport Treasury. It's the Westerlands. One buck. Non-unique. After taxation phase begin, paste, play, bleh, place one gold from your gold pool on Lannisport Treasury. Then it's got a marshalling action. Uh, Neil at Landsport Treasury to move any number of gold from Landsport Treasury to your gold pool. So when taxation begins, that's before you get rid of your gold. So you can throw a gold on it each round. And then when you feel like it during marshalling, you can just kneel it and take as much gold off as you want. So it's kind of a way to store up gold a little bit. It's kind of like an ongoing long plan, but a little slower. But I mean, you can save it up till whenever you need it. So it's kind of cool. Uh, we got Without His Beard. It's a Lannister event. Uh, reaction after you win an intrigue challenge, discard up to three cards at random from the losing opponent's hand. Then that player draws two cards. So I don't know how great this is, but it messes with your opponent. But it could get them better cards than they already have. But at least it reduces the amount of cards they have. But you're playing a card to do it. I don't know. It's goofy. It's fun in draft. Uh, it's coming out soon. Uh, it's got a chapter pack symbol on it. Not the Lions box. So we'll get it eventually. But I don't see anyone really playing this. And we got uh, a Lannister character here. Three cost. Intrigue. Three strength. Red Keep Spy. Non-unique. But she's loyal. Ally and Spy, Ambush 4, so another Ambush character. Reaction after Red Keep Spy enters play using Ambush. Choose a character with printed cost 3 or lower. If you have more cards in hand than that character, that character's controller return it to its owner's hand. So, hmm. Choose a character with printed cost or lower if you have more cards in hand. So you have to have a ton of cards in hand. It kind of bounces in like that Knight and Tyrell, gets rid of a character, throws it back to its owner's hand. Uh, kind of neat. It's a little, little bounce effect. Uh, I like that stuff with Lannister, so it's pretty cool. And this one we got here is Sir Jamie Lannister. And we've seen him uh, posted online already, but it's a five cost character. He's military and intrigue for strength. Um, he's unique, obviously. He's non loyal, though. He's a King's Guard and a Knight. Each Knight character you control gains renown while attacking alone. That's pretty good. And it helps a little rush, a little rush there. So he's got another like fake renown. Um, challenges action, choose a Kingsguard character, including himself, he's a Kingsguard. Um, until the end of the phase, that character gains an Intrigue icon limit once per phase, but 
I don't know why you'd give an intrigue icon, but we do have a faction called Martel that's out there stealing icons like crazy. So that's like a little bit of, a little bit of extra protection there from uh, from the tiers, I guess, um, from your intrigue icon being stolen. But pretty neat character, five costs, not bad. Uh, and he's coming out in the lines of the rock box, it looks like. And then there's another card I drafted here. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's Valar Morghulis. Two costs, zero initiative, zero claim, five reserve, plot deck limit one. When revealed, kill each character. And it's an omen. So this card I played with a lot in first edition. As soon as I saw it in draft, I grabbed it, built my deck around it, thought it was great. And uh, yeah, I ended up winning my draft pod with it. So uh, yeah, pretty good card. Can't wait for it to come. And it's coming in a chapter pack. Obviously, it's number 80 in this cycle. It says there on the bottom. It is a rare card in draft. It's got little R down at the bottom there, if you guys can see that. Um, but anyways, those are the interesting cards that I drafted from our draft pool of eight players. So this is the kind of cool stuff you'll see. A lot of the cards obviously are from the core set in the first cycle, but that was quite a few cards from two players um, from future packs and uh, from the Lions box. So that's, it was kind of neat to see all these cards. It made it cool opening the draft packs. Um, gave it that kind of cool uh, feel, I'm sure, that Magic players drafting, looking for those commons, uncommons, and rares. The fact that it actually has a little symbol on it was kind of neat and gave that feeling. So... Anyways, well, there you have it. That's uh, my overview for Game of Thrones, the card game, second edition draft format, uh, and my review of it. I think it's awesome. I had so much fun. Uh, it might have had something to do with the awesome people I was drafting with. It was fun to draft with friends. I look forward to doing that in the future. Um, I like the whole uh, grabbing your 10 cards this time and seeing cards uh, from future packs and seeing some cool draft only cards in there that I've never seen before and some throwbacks from first edition. It was great to see some older cards come back and some of them with a twist. I think Fantasy Flight did an amazing job with this draft set. I had so much fun. I heard from lots of people who played that it was great and I know people are excited about it. So I hope this uh, kind of covered enough and you guys get a good feel of what draft is and uh, can be ready for it. And uh, I just want to uh, say uh, stay tuned uh, on this channel. Um, Fantasy Flight was actually kind enough to uh, sell me a set of draft packs and starters, including the prizes for an eight-person draft. Uh, so I'm going to do that live on the channel here. Uh, mark your calendars, August 21st, that's a Sunday, uh, around 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, where we're going to draft the eight packs uh, with eight players and then play out three rounds of Swiss and divvy out some prizes. So if you want to come see that, uh, subscribe to the channel to be notified when I go live for that. Uh, and I should have an event go up shortly. Um, so you'll see that on the channel and be reminded of that if you're a subscriber. And uh, yeah, so that's draft. And if you want to support the channel and anything we do here, you can also go to patreon.com forward slash Rob's Gaming Table and donate there to help the channel. So that's it for Draft, guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'll have more coming up for you on the channel, Game of Thrones related. So like I said, subscribe, and thanks a lot for watching.